how movies are like religion in ways both good and bad. Movies entice you to see them, to come and be entertained. Entertainment is the primary motive, until it isn't. Because movies also inform us, inflame us, flood us with emotion or adrenaline. They speak to us of the human condition and all of its beauty and all of its treachery. They exploit and work within and against the underlying assumptions of culture. And the genre that does this the most skillfully is probably comedy, which is why it doesn't translate very well into the international movie scene. There's too much to explain concerning the nuances of culture and why the joke should be funny. And by the time the explanation finishes, it's not funny anymore. And religion, religion entices you to take part, to come and be fulfilled. Fulfillment is arguably the primary motive. But what does that mean, fulfillment, to be filled? That implies that there is something lacking. Another way to think about it is the search or the journey toward balance and wholeness, which implies that there might be lack and there might also be everything needed, just in the wrong proportions. Religion, too, addresses the human condition in all of its beauty and in all of its treachery. It is set within and against the underlying assumptions of the culture from which it was born, which can be a confounding thing, as most religions were born one to three thousand years ago, and even those that have stayed within the same geographical context. Cultures have evolved and merged, touched and recoiled, assimilated, risen and fallen since then. Religion does something else, too. It sets an example for us to follow. Mostly that example is to be commended, but sometimes it is twisted horribly. In that way, it shares that tendency with the movie industry. And before movies, books and stories and myths. In the words of Karen Armstrong, a philosopher and theologian, the myths of the hero, for example, are not meant to give us historical information about Prometheus or Achilles, or for that matter, Jesus or Buddha, or I would add, Luke Skywalker or Clark Kent. She continues to say, their purpose is to compel us to act in such a way that we bring out our own heroic potential. Of course, movies and religion share the same double downfall in this respect as well. Sometimes, nothing happens at all. It was a nice story, whether it was about Spider-Man or Moses. It was a nice story, but we walk away cold, without any clear connection as to how this might change our life for the better, what we might do in a concrete way that would be any diff anything different from what we've always done before. In fact, Sometimes there's not only nothing for us to do any differently, we don't even have so much as a handle on thinking differently. Sometimes there is neither comfort nor challenge. Sometimes there's nothing. And that's not right. And sometimes there is something, and it is dark and twisted. The deepest, most dreadful part of the human experience is mind for its substance, but rather than bringing it up, showing it for what it is, pain, misery, suffering, a soul in need of healing, rest, and respite, instead, it is put up on a pedestal, as if to say, here it is, this is the only truth that is left to us, life's tough, and then you die. And whether that's Heath Ledger as a creepy joker, or a preacher with hellfire burning in his eyes. The message is the same, and that message is that fear is the only thing I have to offer this world. And that's not right. It's not right. And back to Karen Armstrong, she says, she says the religious quest is not about discovering the truth, or even the meaning of life, but about living living as intensely as possible in the here and now. The idea, she continues to say, is not to latch on to some superhuman personality or to get to heaven. 
but to discover how to be fully human. Hence the images of the perfect or enlightened man or the deified human being. Archetypal figures, she continues to say, such as Muhammad or the Buddha or Jesus become icons of fulfilled humanity. God or Nirvana is not an optional extra tacked on to our human nature. Men and women, she says, have a potential for the divine and are not complete unless they realize it within themselves. And so ends the quote. And God, I think, would agree. Isaiah even says over and over, and other places in, in the Christian scriptures and the Hebrew scriptures, God invites us to feasts where we can be fulfilled. And if you think that they're just talking about food in those feasts, let me invite you to broaden your mind. Because that particular part of Isaiah was maybe 25 centuries ago. It was a different time and a different place, but not so very different from many parts of the world today. The idea is that if you have food, you have life. And neither one was to be taken for granted. Images of feasting were a bit more directly related to living life abundantly than perhaps they are now for most of us who feast many times a year for lots of different occasions, from Thanksgiving to Christmas to birthdays and family celebrations, weddings and funerals, any excuse for a party. The point is that we are invited by God to live life abundantly. We are invited by all of our heroes to live into our own heroism, into our own best selves. We have been invited to join the feast, to join the party, and the only thing that can possibly keep us away is ourselves. Paul Hansen says, the only thing that can possibly keep us away is our desire to be elsewhere. We have been invited. The invitations have been sent. Have you received yours?